Captain, flying through the nebula with bulbous rear ends has left the ship in bad shape. What do you mean, like the shape of Phil Collins's domed face? Uh, no, sir, I mean... The backside of a fuel-efficient Mazda. Not quite, sir. That's not... I've got it. Like Piers Morgan's breast implants. Well, that's the closest you've got so far, but please, sir, if I may... Oh, you're no fun. Next, you'll be telling me I can't revolve around and around on my captain's chair, shouting yippee obnoxiously loudly. Well, there's no exact Galactic Army directive against it, sir, although paragraph 6.7b does make a request to keep childish squealing to a minimum. A bunch of fascist cocksuckers. What, sir? Look... I didn't log more flight hours, workout hours, and hairstyling hours in the academy, take an extra minor degree in advanced alien flirting, and rise through the ranks by glad-handing, palm-greasing, and interplanetary warmongering brilliance, just to be told by some second-year fresh buttock spot farm like yourself what I can and can't do on my captain's chair. You'll be telling me next that I can't poop in the torpedo chambers. Wait, you poop in the torpedo chambers? Damn right I do. And I ejaculate into the windscreen wash dispenser. Why? Listen, Private, you don't rise to the prominent rank of captain by playing by the rules. Rules are for ignorant pussies. The kind of people we like to pin down and fart on back in the academy. Why, I alone must have given half the lower ranks pink eye in my day. Day two of basic training. Know what I did? Dare I ask? I dressed up as a mechanical Godzilla beast and went on an elaborate and violent panty raid. I got a commendation for original thinking and three weeks on pan scrubbing duty. Wow. Anyway, sir, the ship, what I was trying to say before is that she's badly damaged and hyper jumps are not going to be available for at least 14 knock trips. Perfect. Slam on the autopilot, fire up the disco ball and tell that curvaceous chef's assistant to meet me in my quarters for some liberal debriefing. <laughs> really, sir, shouldn't we be heading for Omicrotty 7? The Parsnipular peoples are dying in their hundreds daily while Sprague attempts to take over their gutty minds. And Fang Spoon Lotion, Lord of all the Chips, is closing in on Metasupal 2 in the hive of Crandor, threatening to wipe out the voluminous trouser natives if they don't surrender all their car sex and dance a merry jig. Which, for the natives, is impossible because, as you know, sir, they don't have feet. And I, one man, with this a ragtag band of waifs and strays, am just meant to fly in there and solve all their problems, am I? Well, we could try. Uh, we could reroute a gigawire to feed the radiant chamber with... The Listen! I am this close to ejecting you forcibly from the ship using some intricate tubing and a baseball bat. Do you know that every minute of every day, somewhere in the multiverse, some indigenous tribe of three-headed, bat-winged, eight-titted fur clogs are being wiped out by some surly Venezuelan-sounding uber-lord with bad breath and skulls for shoulder pads? Every minute of every day, a planet is atomized so that some enormously bearded, crinkle-headed, three-toed hunchback can have a smidgen more Battenberg cake than the other guy. I can't whiz off to every imminent disaster, save the day with my relaxed attention to detail, rule book defecating on, and hairstyling perfection, only to then bet all the women and eat all of their sacred cheese. Sometimes a man must rest, sometimes a crew must cut loose and get down with their bad selves, and just occasionally, about once a week, in the bath, I have to lather myself up to the sweet, sweet sounds of the after-movie diner. What in the name of all that gargles, foam, and wears a kilt is the after-movie diner? Oh, Jesus. Sometimes you are wetter behind the ears than a toilet dunked halibut on a night out with some particularly rambunctious krill. What's the after-movie diner? That's like asking what's air. What are biscuits? Who's Celia Imry? Who is Celia Embry? Oh, Christ. Sit down, you crad and... Buddy. Aye, Captain. Pump the after-movie diner onto the bridge, please. Fire up the disco ball and tell that curvaceous chef's assistant to meet me up here on the double. I am about to shatter her pelvis with my mind-loving. Aye, you are, sir. Welcome 
to this week's episode of the After Movie Diner. And just a few announcements before we start the show. First up is that I have been all over the shop guesting like a motherfucker in the parlance of our good lady queen. And to that end, I would like to tell you about some of the guest spots. First up, there was the Right Out Loud podcast, which is a fantastic show hosted by my dear friend Andrew Buckley. And I was very, very honored to be on this show and be interviewed uh, by Andrew the other day. Uh, the Right Out Loud podcast can, of course, be found on iTunes or over at Planet Kibi.com. That is K-I-B-I. Now, if you want that in ship's radio speak, that is K for Kilo, I for India, B for Bravo, I for India. Yes, that's correct. PlanetKibi.com. Go over there. Go to the uh, podcastination uh, bit on the menu. Uh, click on that. Scroll down to write out loud and bingo. Uh, mine is the latest episode. Also, uh, if you go over to the Geek Soul Brother and the Nerdy Venoms show... I guessed it on that the other night as well, live. That's uh, the Geek Soul Brother and the Nerdy Venom Show. That can be found on iTunes, on TalkShoe, and I believe over at GeekSoulBrother.com. Yes, indeed, I was right. And lastly, just last night on Sunday, I recorded with my good friends Kyle and Tim over at the Bloodbaths and Boomsticks podcast, which you should all be listening to anyway over at bloodbathsandboomsticks.blogspot.com, or you can find them on Facebook. Uh, but if you're not listening to them, make sure you listen to them. The show will probably go up Wednesday or Thursday. Carl's pretty quick at editing these things and getting them out there. It was a damn good time. I've been a guest on there many times, and it's one of my favorite shows. So please do uh, listen to that when it drops later this week. And now something a little weird for the After Movie Diner. Although if you've listened before, nothing's weird for the After Movie Diner. People might know or they might not know, but I work all day, every day on the phones. Yes, indeed. As if the sound of my own voice for eight hours at work was not enough, I come home and podcast as well. But yes, I work all day on the phones. And sometimes, just sometimes, something jumps into your life to brighten up that work day. And that happened today when I called this voicemail uh, only to hear one of the weirdest Beautiful, strange, wonderful, exciting, different, vibrant, odd, and just quite frankly fucking bananas voicemail I've ever heard. And I thought, I thought that when I got home, I would call the number, record it, and then play it for you. But this one specifically goes out to Mr. Kirk Howley, listening over there in New Jersey. I know you're lying there, Kirk. I know that you've got a blanket over you. I know that you're not wearing anything but a large fedora. And I know that you're going to be excited to hear what comes next. So, should we call the number, children? Let's do it. Hello. Please state your name after the tone, and Google Voice will try to reach. Celestia, Imperial Princess. Now, for those of you who missed that, he said his name was Celestia Imperial Princess. Biggles. That's me giving my name as Biggles. That's the phone ringing. And now check this out. Oh, McDonald. At a farm. E-I. E-I. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't leave a message. I couldn't top that even if I tried. So anyway, uh, after this next little bit of information about the show, we are then going to have one of our musical pieces by none other than the Doctor of the Ivories himself, Mr. Nicholas Consol. That's correct. Mr. Consol is back with one of his wonderful uh, collage, amalgam, musical interpretation, wonderful piano keyboard things. Uh, people who have heard the show before, uh, this is a recent thing that we've started doing. Uh, Nick is a fantastic pianist. He's been on the show uh, as, as a guest. He's also uh, played piano on some of the songs. And, and uh, just, just an all-round guy who's fantastic. He's got a beard. It's amazing. He's beautiful. Anyway, uh, Nick uh, does these pieces, these musical pieces, which are based on the soundtrack of the films that we cover in the show. 
And this week we do a kind of uh, breakfast club brat packy show. And so uh, this is what Nick came up with. So you're going to hear this little bit of information about the after movie diner. And then we are going to go into the glory of Nick Consol's uh, ivory tinkling. And then onto the main body of the show. Then a song, then the end. Enjoy it. Hi, this is director Jim Wynorski. I'm having a big friggin' piece of pie here at the After Movie Diner. We just watched a great show. Check it out. Like the show? Well, you can find our complete podcast archive over at amdpodcast.blogspot.com or aftermoviediner.com. You can send us an email at aftermoviediner at gmail.com, tweet us at aftermoviediner, or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aftermoviediner. Or why not be a part of the show and leave us a voicemail over at speakpipe.com forward slash aftermoviediner. You can also support the show a number of ways, by spreading the word to family, friends and co-workers, by writing us a review over at iTunes or TalkShoe, by purchasing some excellent diner merchandise over at cafepress.com forward slash aftermoviediner, by donating on our website, by advertising with our website, or maybe you're a regular Amazon user. If so, then before you make a purchase, go to amdpodcast.blogspot.com, aftermoviediner.blogspot.com, or aftermoviediner.com and click through the Amazon banner ads. It costs you nothing extra, but they throw us a few coins for the trouble. Or, like the movies we cover, then buy them over at our personal Amazon store, also on amdpodcast.blogspot.com. Really, thanks everybody for everything you continue to do, and please keep listening.
This week, we'd like to welcome back to the After Movie Diner a man of audio-visual prowess, a fantastic Massachusetts-living tall person who has opinions on films from wide and various, uh, a fantastic fella, and always in a positive mood, it seems. Uh, it's Mr. Scott Toomey. Say hello, sir. Hello, sir. How are you? Pleasure to be back. Thank you for inviting me uh, back on the program. Uh, even after our knockdown drag out brawls over uh, Zack Snyder and Man of Steel over the last few months. <laughs> oh, we've hardly had a knockdown. I tell you what, if if if, uh, if we were going to have a knockdown fight about Hack Snyder's Man of Snores, then uh, trust me, you would have known about it. But no, uh, I mean, some, some playful ribbing from me, maybe, <laughs> about how that fucking feeble minded prick needs to learn how to use a tripod. But anyway. <laughs> That's just my little dig. It's my show. I'm allowed to get it in. Absolutely. But, but no, back on the New Year's show, if anyone remembers that, with uh, Scott and our good friend Mo, we did talk about doing something in the realm of Brat Pack or John Hughes or something like that. And because I didn't want to sort of blow our load, as it were, all in one sitting, right. uh, as disgusting as that sounds, uh, we've <laughs> decided to narrow it down tonight to uh, The Breakfast Club and the works of John Hughes that kind of feed in and out of it. So it, it, it won't be a full Brat Pack-centric episode. It's going to be a Breakfast Club-centric episode. But we'll, we'll dip in and out of the world of Hughes as well while we're at it. Definitely. Yeah. So when did you, sir, first sort of... When were you first aware of the world, world of Breakfast Club and John Hughes? Well, it, uh, I, know, I was going to say it's kind of an interesting story, but it really isn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All stories I, are interesting, sir. So. Well, okay. Well, I didn't really start getting into um, into films as big as I am now until I got to college, really. Huh. Um, and when I say that, I, I mean paying more attention to who writes the movies and who directs them and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Before right. that, it was just like, hey, that's a, that's a movie. I'm entertained by it. I like it. That's that. Right. And um, I was ne- I ne- sometimes I didn't even remember titles of movies. But the, the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first uh, John Hughes movie that I was ever exposed to was Ferris Bueller. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, as it were. And... I don't know what it was about it. Sometimes you can't really quite put your finger on what it is exactly about Hughes's movies that just uh, resonate and sit so well with you at long after you've watched them the first time and you keep going back to them uh, time and time again and they're as equally enjoyable as they are the first time you watch them. And I think after that one, Sixteen Candles was probably the next one because I have a sister, and Sixteen Candles is a bit more female-centric because of the main character played by Molly Ringwald. Right. Um, but in my opinion, uh, well, maybe we'll get we'll get onto that later. So Sixteen Candles was the next one, and then I'm trying to think. When I got to school in college, a girl that I had dated for about a week had a Breakfast Club poster on her wall. And nice. Back then, I had I didn't even know that all three of those movies were done were written by the same guy you know, nor directed. And I was just like, Oh, you know what? I've heard a lot about that movie. Maybe I should watch it. And I watched it and I was really just kind of blown away by it. And then, so I sought out more of his movies. Uh, actually weird science. I saw before breakfast club. I apologize. Weird science has always been one of my favorites and the breakfast club and, uh, some kind of wonderful and, uh, Dutch is one of my favorites. <laughs> and, um, you know, Christmas vacation and, uh, you know, the first vacation movie. So I've definitely seen my fair share of, uh, each one of his more notable films, uh, and quite a few times each. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I was only aware of who he was probably by the time I was sort of 13 and, Breakfast Club and Weird Science were kind of the two uh, teenagery ones that yeah. I would have been watching around that time. And I think I was introduced to The Breakfast Club, maybe I'm right in saying by my friend Will Eagle. I don't know. I seem to have a recollection of him watching that and Weird Science and stuff like that. But uh, I remember those two back to back as being like John Hughes movies. Yeah. But at the same time and before, I was aware of The Great Outdoors, the vacation movies, all of them, Home Alone, obviously, yep. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Uh, not so much 
the other uh, Brat Pack ones, not so much Pretty in Pink and Ferris Bueller and Sixteen yeah. Candles yet. That would come later. But I was certainly aware of his more, uh, uh, you know, comedic uh, films starring kind of like SNL and SCTV guys. Sure. But had never, ever put it together that he wrote them or in some cases also directed them yeah. uh, until much, much later. And it's sort of, you know, we'll get onto this in a little bit because we've got some comments from Mr. Doug Tilly about John Hughes, but that I'd like to read out and have a discussion about. But, you know, with a list, if you go onto his IMDb page, with a list of the films that he's got, whether they resonate to you or not, whether you appreciate some of the messages in them or not. They are yeah. all certainly well-written, funny, uh, interesting movies that cannot help but inform... If you grew up and you're our age group in your 30s now, in your early 30s or whatever, yeah. it can't help but inform your movie watching taste for a large chunk of your life. Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, we were Steve Martin fans, so we would watch Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. I was a big John Candy fan, so obviously mm-hmm. Planes, Trains, Uncle Buck, Great Outdoors. They were all ones I watched frequently, you know, uh, and European Vacation and Christmas Vacation were two of my, my favorite chase movies. So <laughs> I, I sort of was all over that lot. It was later that I kind of picked up 16 Candles and Pretty in Pink and those yeah. kind of ones. And, you know, obviously they're a little bit more, as you said, female centric. So they don't, they don't resonate. They're fine. They're well written. They're, you know, they are what they are. But they don't right. really resonate big time with me. The Breakfast Club, though, and I've watched it recently as well. I watched it recently with my buddy who's been on the show a lot, John Wallace, yep. and his wife. And it's it's one of those that, you know, is so well written, has such a good script, and such mm-hmm. a clean simplistic or seemingly simplistic concept yeah. to it that it that it works as well as it does is kind of a bit of a bit of a surprise i thought what, what do you think it's just completely the only way that i can describe it is is to say that it's just completely and totally watchable from minute one to fade to black Right. The whole, the, you know what I mean? Like, it's uh, it's the the beats of the story are so perfectly woven together, and the introduction of each character and how their particular stories kind of play out throughout the whole movie. It's all just done so perfectly that, yeah. I mean, I I can only because. I didn't, I mean, when did that come out? 85. So I was only four years old when that movie came out. So I didn't really know when, like how the marketing was for it. But to think back at how a studio could have marketed this movie, it just, I, I don't know how they could have. Right. Because, I mean, at the, at the surface, who wants to go see a movie about, you know, five, is it five, five kids total? Yeah. Who wants to go see a movie about five kids in Saturday Detention? You know what I mean? But it's so much more than that, though. It is now 7.06. You have exactly eight hours and 54 minutes to ponder the error of your ways. Any questions? Yeah. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? A brain, a beauty, a jock, a rebel, and a recluse. I can't believe this is really happening to me. Before this day is over, they'll break the rules. <coughs> Chicks cannot hold a smoke. That's what it is. Bear their souls. I'm an infomaniac. Are your parents aware of this? Take some chances. Being bad feels pretty good. Huh? And touch each other in a way they never dreamed possible. Why'd you do that? Because I knew you wouldn't. The Breakfast Club. They only met once. I don't want to be alone anymore. You don't have to be. But it changed their lives forever. I mean, I consider you guys my friends. I'm not wrong, am I? Universal Pictures presents Emilio Estevez, Paul Gleason, Anthony Michael Hall, Judd Nelson, Molly Ringwald, and Ali Sheedy in a John Hughes film. Why are you being so nice to me? Because you're letting me. The Breakfast Club. Yeah, I mean, let's go to the Facebook page quick thing. Let's let's answer some of these things that have been put through. We've got, I put down, uh, you know, what's everyone's favorite Hughes movie, character, moment scene, quote, and and worst John Hughes film. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Douglas Tilly, the uh, wonderful uh, and always passionately outspoken uh, <laughs> co-host of uh, No Budget Nightmares 
and with Ashley Montgomery, the wonderful Ashley Montgomery, the Above the Line podcast, which I do suggest people listen to. And people will remember from our, if you want to talk about knockdown, drag out brawls, our <laughs> Django Unchained podcast oh, uh, rattled some cages. I don't know. <laughs> don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. I, I had a real paranoia after that show went out, and Tilly's going to laugh at this, but I had a real paranoia after that show went out that Tilly wasn't talking to me anymore. <laughs> Because <laughs> you can't tell over the internet, of course, whether no, people are mad or not. But anyway, I don't, I don't think he is. Uh, but he's still as grumpy and opinionated as ever. <laughs> I like to think of Tilly as the other side of the coin to me. We're both grumpy and opinionated, just normally <laughs> at the opposite ends of things. But he said, since I recently, along with Ashley, sat up to watch an all-night Hughes marathon... I feel comfortable answering these questions. I should preface by saying that I think many Hughes films are generally sort of awful and mm. reinforce all sorts of unpleasant stereotypes. Uh, he says Planes, Trains and Automobiles is his favourite. Okay. His favourite character is Long Duck Dong. Just kidding. He says, I'll go with Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay. I'm, I'm more like him than I care to admit. <laughs> uh, he says uh, the favourite scene is the assault on the house via post-apocalyptic crazies, including Vernon Wells and Michael Berriman in Weird Science. Nice. His favourite quote is, I made my family disappear, raises eyebrows twice from Home Alone. <laughs> and his worst John Hughes film is Sixteen Candles. He calls it oh, racist, wow. sexist and class. Hmm. So before we go on and dissect Douglas's <laughs> clear problems that he has with his childhood and just being sure. able to relax and enjoy films, <laughs> he's generally not going to talk to me after this podcast. Uh, what, what, what would your answers be to that question, sir? I, wow. Um, I favorite probably, Hughes movies. Favorite Hughes movie. I would, I'm actually going to have to go with the opposite of him and say that my favorite Hughes movie is... 16 candles actually right. <laughs> um i just think it's hilarious in every way possible and even though the meet the main character is a female a lot of the um uh, you know a lot of the issues that she goes through in the movie are the, the uh, either either sex can go through those when they're growing up right. you know what i mean yeah, like per um, periods, breast growth. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, I was a little late with mine, uh, right. you know, my first. But uh, anyway. <laughs> well, we know, uh, we know, Scott, from pre our, our, our New Year's Eve show that, you know, you are in touch with your feminine side when it comes so. to film film watching. And you're uh, you're all about the the soft side of movies to some, some regard. Absolutely. So it should come as no surprise that I had picked 16 Candles as my favorite John Hughes movie. Right. Although um, that is the one with uh, Harry Dean Stanton as the dad, though, right? That's uh, oh, is that Pretty, pretty in Pink. Pink. Yeah, oh, okay. that's Pretty in Pink, yeah. Okay. That's definitely, in my opinion, the straight-up, you know, quote-unquote chick flick of the Hughes films, I think. Uh, okay. Um, I think 16 Candles can actually kind of teeter-totter on that you know, category or what have you. So 16 Candles is, is definitely my favorite. Ferris Bueller is probably like a close second. Favorite Hughes character. Oh, this is good. My favorite Hughes character is actually Chet from Weird Science. Okay. Because every line that he says in that movie is is also my favorite quote. Right. Um, you two donkey dicks couldn't get laid in a morgue. <laughs> and uh, feeling a little queasy? How about a nice greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ashtray? The guy is such an asshole and played so perfectly by Bill Paxton that I, I, uh, I that was one of the reasons why that one is probably the one that I watched the most. And because, you know, Kelly LeBrock was quite attractive uh, back in the day. So oh, well, it's, it's the nice thing about weird science is it's imaginative. It's, yes. It's inventive and creative in a so way this, that <clears throat> movies aren't allowed to be anymore. Yeah. It's a, it's a, sci, it's a sci-fi fantasy teen comedy. You don't see stuff like that very much I nowadays. Think for some reason, invention and creativity has moved to things like Pixar movies and, and the, the, Ardman animation stuff and things like yeah. that. It seems to be the animation where, you know, if you look at something like Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, that's that's an incredibly inventive, creative, weird and wonderful. I know it's based on a book, but weird and wonderful animation where a bunch of sure. stuff, a bunch of crazy stuff happens. You wouldn't really get a movie like that so much. Uh, I don't, th I don't think. I can't think of one. Um, okay, so you said that your what was your worst John Hughes film? Worst? Wow. Um, everybody loves this one, but I'd have to say that planes, trains, and automobiles didn't really do much for me. And I only, I only saw it for the first time over the last year. Right. Um, and it just, 
I don't know, it just didn't hit me as as much as some of the other ones did. I didn't think it was really as funny as I feel some of the other movies that he uh, has done are. I like the chemistry between John Candy and Steve Martin. I think that's probably the best part of the movie and the and, and the one thing, in my opinion, that it has going for it. Right. But a lot of like the comedy beats, I just didn't. I was just like, eh. I've seen. I feel. I felt like I've seen better in other movies from him. Yeah. And maybe it's because I waited so long to see it. I'm not sure. But at, at this at this point in time, I would have to pick that one as my least favorite, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's got a certain vibe to it. I can't say that I'm sort of deeply tuned into it either, mm. although I do love the central performances, some of the lines and some of the stuff that happens. But I can't say that I'm dialed into it 100% either. My favorites would probably be The Breakfast Club, uh, Christmas Vacation, Weird Science, mm. and probably The Great Outdoors. They would probably be my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, My favorite Hughes character would probably be John Bender from The Breakfast Club. (laughs) Because it kind of has to be. You are a parent's wet dream. Well, that's a problem. Look, I could see you getting all bunged up for them making you wear these kind of clothes. But face it, you're a neo-maxi-zoom dweeby. What would you be doing if you weren't out making yourself a better citizen? Why do you have to insult everybody? I'm being honest, asshole. I would expect you to know the difference. What's the next one? Favorite Hughes moment or scene? Mm. I might have to agree with Doug and say the post-apocalyptic crazies, because that's a pretty awesome scene. Yeah, I always love that scene, too. (laughs) But also, you know, there are scenes in The the Great Outdoors that stick with me. The, Mm -hmm. you know, the bear who's had its, all its ass head blown off. (laughs) By the buckshot and the, you know, John Candy and Dan Aykroyd dressed up ready to fight a bat. Yeah. That's pretty genius. <laughs> I also love the scene where Uncle Buck takes down the high school principal in Uncle Buck, oh, where he says, yep. go down the road and <laughs> gather. That's a good one. Because they're all good kids. Until dried out, brain dead skags like you drag them down and convince them they're no good. You so much as scowl at my niece. Or any other kid in this school, and I hear about it, and I'm coming looking for you. Take this quarter. Go downtown and have a rap gnaw that thing off your face. Yeah, there's there's, there's too many good ones there. Some I... of my sorry, I was just gonna say, but I, I know I mentioned Dutch earlier in the in the in the talk. It's I watch it every year religiously at Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite, you know, like uh, Thanksgiving movies to watch, quote unquote. And uh, Ed O'Neill is just so friggin' hilarious, and, and there's just a lot of good lines where um, Ethan Embry, who uh, at the time that this that Dutch was made was known as Ethan Randall, but Ethan Embry from uh, Empire Records and what's the other one that he's in? Uh, I forget. Anyway, I mean, there's just a, they have a the the two of them have really good chemistry and there's a lot of classic lines. Ethan, Ethan Embry's character studies karate and at one point in the in the film he says how he's a high brown belt and then later on they go to hitchhike or whatever and. Uh, Ethan Embry's like, we we can't do that. We're going to get mugged. And, and Ed O'Neill is just like, well, you have a high brown belt. What are you worried about? And it's just the, the, the delivery of a lot of the lines in that movie really just make me laugh out loud. Yeah, I think I know Embry <laughs> from Harold and Kumar and Can't Hardly Wait. I think there you go. The That's the other one. Can't Hardly I, Wait was the other one, yeah. That I've seen. But no, I mean, not, not surprisingly, because obviously we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. Dutch is not one that we ever see. I've never sure. seen it. And it's certainly not one that's screened in the uk yeah. now it's easy with the worst john hughes to kind of go well curly sue or yeah, one of the easy. home alone ones or beethoven yeah. or whatever or but made in manhattan right or but if we're talking classic hughes yeah up until let's say dutch is the cutoff point in 91 yep. if we're talking his 80s movies i gotta be surprised i've got to surprise a few people and say mm-hmm. that i think his worst movie for me mm. is ferris bueller's day off okay that's interesting i'd like to hear what your explanation for that is <laughs> i i find i find the character of ferris Be- now don't get me wrong i mean maybe i'm being i love all the other characters in the movie yeah but Matthew Broderick as Ferris Bueller needs to be to have a 
Spike rammed up his rectum and then set fire to. He's he's one of the worst cinematic characters that's ever been created. Every, everything else, Alan Ruck is great, Jeffrey Jones is great, Jennifer mm-hmm. Grey is fine, no problem with him. In fact, Jeffrey Jones, you know, despite who he is in reality, right. Jeffrey Jones is my favourite part of any movie that Jeffrey Jones is in. <laughs> Except maybe without a clue where he is the third favourite thing in that movie, <laughs> next to Michael Caine and Ben Kingsley. But and Alan Ruck is great. Yeah. But Matthew Broderick is, the, and that character is the most punchable, obnoxious, mm-hmm. arrogant tit ever to be put in a film. And and it 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 makes it impossible for me to kind of watch it and embrace it in the way that I think a lot of other people did. Now I didn't see it early on. I didn't see it when I myself was a young, rambunctious, arrogant, tit-faced sure. teen. <laughs> so maybe if I did, I would have more you know, more to relate to. But I find yeah. Ferris Bueller such an annoying ass. I mean, then, you know, some kind of wonderful, it's fine. I mm. find Eric Stoltz a slappable, you know, uh, weird, too serious uh, ginger madman. Uh, but so <laughs> I actually like him for that. <laughs> right. No, no, I like Eric Stoltz in a yeah. sort of bizarre kind of, not quite ironic way, but just like, oh, look, it's Eric Stoltz. It's just a funny word to say. But but in his p- yeah. part in uh, in that, it's pre- he's pretty awful. The thing that to me anyway, some kind of wonderful is just pretty in pink, but flipped around. Right, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, you know, no. I, I don't have an issue with that. I I like some kind of wonderful. I I think Eric Schaefer plays a fantastic, um, like pricky villain. Right. And I, I love Leah Thompson. So yeah, uh, I mean, but I never understood what the what the 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 draw was for Mary Stuart Masterson. I never thought she was very attractive no. back then, nor do I now. And I, if they had cast somebody, Ali maybe, Sheedy. Or, yeah, or uh, some somebody who was just a little bit more, I don't know. I, 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 guess had, I, had, I had the biggest crush. We'll get on to my Ali Sheedy thing when we get <laughs> on to the Breakfast Club movie, but I have the biggest crush on uh, on on Ali Sheedy, it's ridiculous. But mm. if we go by just the movies he directed, then probably yeah. Curly Sue is the worst movie he ever made. Uh, yeah, see, with... I've never even seen it just because I've heard such horrible things about it. With... And I don't buy Jim Belushi as like a lovable, uh, like father type. I person. love Jim Belushi. <laughs> I love him too, but I don't buy him in this in this movie i don't know why i mean i love him in the principal does that count right of course and k9 <laughs> and and all yeah, those exactly. he's incredible but uh please look to previous jim belushi episode of yes. the after movie done i <laughs> think i'm probably the only film retrospective podcast that's ever done a jim belushi episode please write in and tell me if i'm wrong uh because i don't think many people have the love for the belushi that I do. Mm. Uh, I follow him on Twitter, the man's a legend. He has a, a canine style Alsatian dog for nice. real in reality. I didn't know that he's, that they've made like five canine movies and they're all like different. No, they've made three. Oh, I thought there was more than that. No, there's three with Jim Belushi that have the dog being Jerry Lee, even though it's not played by Jerry Lee each time. It's played by a different dog oh. uh, because obviously they were years and years apart. But, uh, the the character of Dooley and, and Jerry Lee are only in three, and they're all okay. None yeah. of them are bad films. So, but we're getting off into a whole Belushi topic because yeah, once yeah. once my Belushi <laughs> radar is out there, I get all <laughs> kinds of things. But I I mean I like to think of John Hughes because he's I don't know what you think about his direction. It's it's mm. fairly run of the mill to be honest. It services the script perfectly. Sure, sure. I mean he's definitely in that. Uh, Kevin Smith mold, or rather Kevin Smith is in the mold of a John Hughes quite consciously and, and I think self-admittedly yeah. in, in the fact... Well, the, the real talent is in the writing, basically. Right. The, the script is all important and then the, the direction really just services that. And, yep. and look, I, you know, uh, John Hughes knows how to use a tripod, never yep. felt the need to <laughs> wave the camera about. Nope. He, he never felt the need to go on and above what was needed for the script. He, he right. filmed it very well, so therefore I'm not... I, I don't come down on him. Any more than people who say that Kevin Smith is a bad director, they're wrong. Mm. They're just wrong. He is a good director for his material. Yeah, you know what I mean? he can't so, direct other people's stuff worth a damn. 
No, <laughs> but although Cop Out, the script for Cop Out was just shit. I, yeah, I mean, it's exactly. You, well, he didn't write that, I don't think, did he? No, he didn't. That's what you're saying. He can't yeah. direct other people's stuff okay. worth a damn. I'm saying that <laughs> the only movie Kevin Smith has directed that he didn't write is Cop Out. It's the worst film he's ever done. Yeah. And I think the script wasn't good to begin with. Mm. I think the script, you get a bad script, you get Bruce Willis on a, clearly on a bad month, just not yeah. wanting to be in the film. Weird. And, you know, uh, you get Tracy Morgan desperately trying to be yeah. everything he can be, but, like, it doesn't <laughs> work. But that's by the by. So uh, we go back to Doug Tilly and more of his misery. Yes, yes. Quickly. So he says, I, I said, thanks for the feedback, man. No mention of The Breakfast Club. Interesting. He said, I dislike The Breakfast Club. He's the only right. person on the planet, I swear to Christ. <laughs> he says, particularly, it's just get a makeover and people will like you message. But I don't feel particularly strongly one way or another regarding its quality. It doesn't represent my own teenage experience in any way. But obviously, it speaks to some people. I think it had some good lines, but aside from Judd Nelson, the acting, has never impressed me and it's oversimplified to a really bizarre degree despite writing so many films about them I don't think Hughes had any particular insight into what the life was like for a teenager in the 1980s I think Fast Times at Richmond High say anything or Savage Steve Holland's films uh, like Better Off Dead and stuff of the time yeah. period are much more interesting and relevant. Huh. He said, I mean, I saw Weird Science and Ferris Bueller's, Bueller's Day Off dozens of times as a kid. I still think, them, think there's a lot more clever material in those movies and some really fun dialogue, but there's just so much troublesome material. That scene where Anthony Michael Hall does his black voice in Weird Science is, yeah, not good. So lots of points there, um, Scott, and feel free uh, to take it away first. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know that I buy any of that, really. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm I mean, going to let you yeah. say all the negative shit to Doug, and then I'll pipe in it's, afterwards. Uh, I know nowadays, uh, and, and uh, it's funny to me that he designates that to be uh, Anthony Michael Hall's quote-unquote black voice. I don't see that that's what it is at all. Well, no, because... no, I mean, I, I have to admit there, he has already said in interviews he was doing Richard Pryor. He was, mm-hmm. That was his black voice. That's Okay. Because I, I really. in The Breakfast Club, he does it when he's high, and then in Weird Science, he does it when, it, when he's drunk. So I just thought myself that, oh, that's just the voice that he likes to do when he is playing a character that's under the influence of a, oh, of a, of a, innocent, of a substance. Innocent, <laughs> innocent to me. What, I look, what, I, what are we going to do with you? I always look at the lighter side of life, you know? Of course. So. <laughs> um, and then uh, as far as, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess he makes valid points, but it's like a lot, you got to keep in mind that these movies were made during in a different time, you know what I mean, where a lot of these a lot of the stuff and the way that these people talk and uh, uh, you know the representations of of minorities in the films, yeah, they're stereotypical. But I think at that time, the, that's what people had their exposure to. Well, no, does that, I make, just, does that make sense? Yes, yes, to some extent. I think that I think the reason why the Breakfast Club is the way it is, and we'll get onto this film more specifically in a yeah, moment. Let's do that. But the reason why the Breakfast Club is like it is, it's because schools, whether Doug experienced or not, have cliques. Now, they, might oh, not, they may not be the cliques that he uh, does as stereotypes in the Breakfast Club, but that's merely just a way to say, look, in school there are different groups of people, whether they're mm-hmm. hippies, goths, punks, whatever, whatever it was, however you went through school, nerds, geeks, you know, yeah. whatever it is, there are different groups of people. The fact that Hughes you know, narrows in on these particular ones, the princess and the jock and the thief and all the rest of it. it, You know, that was what he chose to make the point that he's making. The the other thing that Doug said about just get a makeover and people will like you, Mm. it is a problem that I have with the film. I don't think that's the message of that bit, though. Mm. Uh, I think that... I think think, uh, Emilio Estevez's character was already... I think he, he was already starting to like her before that. I think the it fact was almost that, just kind of a bonus that she ended up looking hot at the end. <laughs> but she doesn't. That's my main problem with the ending is not oh. is not the makeover and people like you. It's that they yeah. make Ali Sheedy ugly. Ali Sheedy is so much fitter mm. as like the gothy weirdo character she plays okay. in the other ninety minutes of the movie. The 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 thing that I like though that saves it is when he says at the end, I can finally see your face. Yeah. So I think it's not, that saves it to me. It's not so much like put on a bunch of makeup and take off your black shit and people will right. accept you. It's more just the, 
let people see you. I th- yeah, I, th- I think what Hughes is saying is that the affectation she puts on all the way through the movie of being mm-hmm. the weird little goth chick, yeah. that's her makeup. And actually taking that off is revealing, you know, more of her and yeah. making her bear herself a bit more. Now, okay, that might be looking into it too deeply. That might be. No, I, 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 I like that. I think it makes a lot of sense, actually. I, you know, I think that the idea is that underneath all the shit that teenagers and adults put on in order to get through the day, whatever your armor is, whether sure. it's I'm going to be a loud, brash asshole, or whether it's going to be like I'm going to be a nerdy guy, or whether it's I'm going to be a, you know, I'm going to wear like long coats and fingerless gloves and whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> you know, whatever your battle armor is to deal with life you know sometimes the the bravest thing to do is to take it all off now you know the thing that negates that is the fact that she puts on makeup and there's the white top and the whole bit i think that there's a better less hollywood way of making that point but i still think that working within the restrictions that hughes had and the studio system and all the rest of it and and the fact that the audience watching it are going to be a bunch of kids who let's be fair most of whom are not going to relate to ali shidi's character they're going to relate far more to uh you know the jock or the princess or the idea of just a girly girl as opposed to more of the kind of tomboy freak you know so uh they're going to more rep they're going to appreciate more the ending on that thing I agree with Doug to some extent that if you have any kind of left field sensibility, the ending is a little, you know, uh, too neatly tied up in a bow. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's a high school movie, you know, that, that look, I think Kevin Smith says this about his films, and it's certainly the truth with, with, with Hughes. It's like, look, I'm making a dopey comedy, but if I can whip some message in there, if I can whip yeah. something in there, then isn't that better than what these other cats are doing? Like, if your high school movies at the time are Porky's or Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which personally I don't feel has anything to say about anything, mm. if you whip in a little bit of message about what it's like to be isolated as a teenager, what it's like to have different parents, different upbringings, different backgrounds, different pressures, different that's... That's doing more than most teenage comedies at the time. Revenge of the yeah. Nerds is not doing any of that. You know what no. I mean? Uh, so still love it, but it's not still doing love it. it. Oh no, no, of course, <laughs> right, right, right. I still love dick and fart jokes. I'm not saying yeah. that, but I'm saying you know that at least use attempts, whether you think he's right or wrong, attempts to whip in some stuff there. And for me. Even though I didn't go to high school in America, I never had all-day Saturday detention. I wasn't a criminal, uh, a math geek. I wasn't a, a freak. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really any of those things. Yeah. I still relate to the idea of the, and I think the most poignant bit in the movie is when they talk about, look, will will we be friends on Monday? I think that's yeah. the key to the film. And I had so many occasions in high school where. Over a weekend, because I was at I was at a, a, a boarding school. Of the yep. weekend, I would make friends with and hang out with some guy in one of the upper years yep. who normally wouldn't give me the time of day, and we would like play guitar and have a great time. And then come Monday, he would punch me in the face in front of his friends so that I, you know, I wasn't part of his friend group anymore. Yep. You know, he would push me out of the way. So that whole thing resonates with me completely. But so I take some of what Doug says on board, but. You know, I, I I also have to kind of say I, I don't agree. And I think that while Say Anything, the other movies he mentioned, while Say Anything is a fantastic film. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Incredibly well written, incredibly well acted, uh, and and certainly says a lot about that certain type of character that Lloyd mm-hmm. Dobler is. And I think, you know, he says that Breakfast Club is oversimplifying the cliches. I think Lloyd Dobler is a fantasy character. I don't think anyone is as eloquent, as relaxed, as loving, as whatever, as Lloyd Dobler is. We all wish we were, but I don't think any of us actually were at that mm-hmm. age group, although it's certainly something to relate to. Say Anything is probably uh, as good as any of the Hughes movies. I can't say that Fast Times, Richmond High, or Better Off Dead, or any of those uh, particularly speak to me. They're fine films, they're funny yeah. comedies, but... You I was know. trying to I was trying to think of some other movies that maybe came a little bit later that were kind of uh, you know in the vein of like a of a John Hughes and you know Cameron Crowe I think kind of carried that torch with Say Anything and even a little bit with 
singles, even though it was like an old, it was an older crowd. Um, almost famous has, has yeah, almost famous is, is great. And, uh, a lot of people uh, criticize it, but I think something like Elizabeth town had certain aspects yeah, absolutely. in its script. I mean, a lot of people criticize that movie and I think it's got a lot to do with Borlando bland, but it, outside <laughs> of him, the script to Elizabeth town has lots of echoes of say anything to be yeah. fair in its characters and in its, in its set pieces and in its makeup. Uh, so I don't discount that movie either yeah. of Cameron Crowe's uh, particular. You might, <laughs> I'm not sure how you feel about this one, but garden state is even harkens back to a little John Hughes esque type of, uh, yeah, I type, guess. Type, I, of th- type of things thematically, I think. I guess so. I mean, there's a lot of those kind of teeny angsty or early adult, uh, what could they called mumblecore. Yeah. You know, the kind of Zoe Deschanel, Zach Braff movies, which eh. certainly have it in their makeup. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah, let's go on anyway. I mean, Doug, I, I, understand where he's coming from i yeah. completely see it. i i don't agree though and as for things like 16 candles being racist sexist and classes yeah. first first of all i would have to argue that the 80s were a completely different decade secondly i would have to say that it's not i i don't think it's actually actively going out of its way to be either racist or or sexist. I don't no. think it has an evil bone in its body. Nope. I, I think that you can say that the humour is maybe not the humour of now because there are certain comments on, you know, Long Duck Dong's uh, uh, being a foreign exchange student or whatever. But a Chinaman. Oh, <laughs> but, right, a Chinaman. But ultimately, he gets a girl and is happy and, exactly. you know, has a great time in that movie. It's not like he is a persecuted... It's. You know, it's not like Mickey Rooney in fucking Breakfast at Tiffany's or any of that kind of stuff. You know, it's pl- right. it's played by an Asian actor. It's you know, and was he marginalized? Yeah, of course. But I mean, most Asian actors in eighties movies were marginalized. I mean, Big Trouble in Little China is a fucking awesome movie, but all the Asian actors in that movie yeah. play very stereotypical. Uh, you know, and if you want to say racist, but I don't think it is because mm-hmm. whatever they play very stereotypical mystics from the east type characters, yeah. and and at least Long Duck Dong, as I say, is seen. He's I don't see him as a character of ridicule in no. Sixteen Candles at all. As for sexist, I don't know. I would have to talk to Doug about about exactly what he means by that. But considering it has a female lead, yeah, uh, you know. There are when we were doing our, our Doctor Action Female Action Month, there are actually so few films with a strong positive female lead. I mean it's 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 scary yeah. when you go through how many and I not just action films, but 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 teenage films and even so called rom coms that have a genuinely feminist leading strong female character most rom-coms come down to the guy oh he's a bit of a roguish dick but isn't yeah. he mr charming and wasn't <laughs> i a bitch to not love him in the end right uh, it, most well, that sounds like 10 things i hate about you right exactly <laughs> so you know i i have to say I, I i find i also find being overly serious about something like 16 candles a bit a bit silly to be honest mm-hmm. Breakfast Club, I think, is a different beast, a different animal. I don't think 16, Club, uh, 16 Candles is trying to say anything uh, in the same way that Breakfast Club is trying to say stuff. Uh, you know, so I, I can't get overly bothered <laughs> by anything yeah, I hear what you're saying. in Pretty in Pink or 16 Candles or any of those, what I call just, they're just teenage, you know, have a party movies. They're no different than, you know... The party scene and say anything or whatever, sure. you know, it's to me, it's all the same kind of thing. Or Fast Times at Ridgemont High or... Yep. But so let's go on. We've got Eric Hodgins. I'm uh, hoping, no. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name right. He says his favorite movie is Uncle Buck Breakfast Club. His nice. favorite character is Cameron. His favorite scene is John Candy scaring Bug in Uncle Buck. Uh, that's a classic. <laughs> His, yeah, very, very cool, very cool. Yeah. And Uncle Buck is definitely one we'll need to do further on down the line. Give some yes. some candy love. We'll have to do <laughs> a candy episode, definitely down the line. Uh, Chevy Chase's rant in Christmas Vacation is his favorite quote. And when Santa <laughs> squeezes his fat white ass down that chimney tonight, he's going to find the jolliest bunch of assholes this side of the nut house. Uh, I'm trying to do my 
my uh, best chase there. Not very good. good. <laughs> <laughs> but again, we know that you're a simple man <laughs> with simple pleasures. Yes, yes. I'm kidding. Uh, he says, so are we only including movies he directed? If he includes movies he produced, Baby's Day Out would be hands down the worst. Uh, his hottest moment, he adds his own question here. Oh. Hottest moment, Kelly LeBrock in the doorway, weird science. Oh, yeah. Definitely. See, I was never a LeBrock fan. It could, I don't know whether it was the hair, whether it was the accent, whether it was the lips, or whether it was the fact that she's had sex with Stephen Seagal. Well, what, is, uh, what, what was this um, write-in's uh, name? Eric Hodgins. All right. Is, now, do we know if Eric is from the States or if he's from the UK? Because I'm thinking maybe since you're from the UK, the accent doesn't do it, doesn't do it for you. But right. for us, it does it for us. He's, he's Canadian, eh? Ah, okay. Well, then it would do it for him, too, since he's not, it's not something that he's used to hearing all the time. Right. So... Um, and the other things you described are, in my opinion, the better <laughs> parts. Of course. Aside from maybe the hair. The hair could be toned down a little bit, but the lips, my God. <laughs> yeah, the lips. My God, the lips. You sounded like Woody Allen just then. The lips. My God, the lips. Um, so, <laughs> um, no, I mean, all of those are great answers. Uh, I can't I can't disagree with any of those at all. You know, I, I also have to say, like, congratulate Hughes for the fact that he went through his career and didn't do, you know, although Weird Science is all about her being a hot goddess from sure. the world of computers, there's no titties in any nope. of these films. So, you know, and other movies that we've mentioned resort to titties for everything yeah. from Animal House through to Porky's to, you know, any other teen movie you can name right up to American Pie, fucking yep. whatever. It's all about the titties. And, and I, I know that in Mall Rats, Kevin Smith was a little uneasy putting the tits in that scene with the, yeah. um, uh, with Joey Lauren Adams. But, and, you know, and he hasn't done it since. Um, so he's more of the Hughes model. I kind of respect, although I'm a lover of the boobs, I kind of respect Hughes for not, not resorting to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, especially in that day and age and you're making a quote unquote teen comedy. Yeah. It's like, I would be surprised if the studios weren't almost kind of saying you gotta have boobies in this, in this scene, you know, you gotta show tits. Right. So I'm sure if that was the case, he uh, obviously fought them on it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone watches Weird Science these days and is like, Christ, if that was me, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'd, I'd have her bent over the chaise long in the living room before you could say whoopsie or something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'd be double teaming her with uh, uh, Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Hall. But anyway... Uh, I don't know why I'm the other guy, why I'm the non-famous guy. I should have made yeah. myself... Yeah, what's his Anthony name? Ellen, Ellen, Ellen Mitchell Smith. I think he teaches history at some school now. Probably. But he, was, he was in the film adaptation of uh, The Chocolate War. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, piece of writing. No. All right, you'll have to look it up after the show. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, stuff him. Well, I don't know why I made myself him. So I would be double-teaming her with... And maybe because he's got an unpronounceable name. How do you pronounce that first name? I, 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 Illin? Illin? I don't know. That's what I say. Illin. Illin Mitchell Smith or Illin Michael Smith, something well, like that. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about him again until he requisitions a new but name. He, but he flat out makes out with Kelly LeBrock in the movie, so you might be better off being him as opposed to Anthony Michael Hall. So Right. I, I guess so. I guess so. But <laughs> I don't know, man. I've got to th I think Michael Hall, he's the badass in these movies, I think, in his own way. He's actually probably my my favorite actor that's in uh, a, a, a frequent amount of these movies. Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, my favorite of all of them, and he's not in The Breakfast Club, is Andrew McCarthy. But that's uh, just, I have a weird, me and Dr. Action as well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out Dr. Action as a McCarthy fan. It's kind of weird seeing him play the characters that he plays in these, you know, in the earlier movies. And then when he goes on to be just kind of like a goofy goofball in Weekend at Bernie's it's like I didn't know that, that that he had that in him to play a different kind of character but I haven't seen a lot of his work so I guess maybe I'm just not exposed enough in McCarthy in St. Elmo's Fire much like parts of John Bender in The Breakfast Club and parts of Lloyd Dobrin say anything yep. if you could put them all together that's kind of who I wanted to be and mm -hmm. partly who I was. I mean, I relate to the St. Elmo's, uh, Elmo's Fire character, the McCarthy character, 
all too well. Now, I never, like, fancied a friend's girlfriend or wife. Like, that was right. never it. But I'm talking about, like, <laughs> the guy who was ranting against, you know, the industrial machine and the pol- political machine while secretly sure. not giving a shit and really just liking Aretha Franklin music, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that was me. Uh, still is, probably, if truth be told. <laughs> It's time for a little mid-show commercial break, and seeing as I was feeling just the teensy-weensy bit guilty about laying into good old Doug Tilly, I thought I'd plug his and Ashley Montgomery's great Above the Line podcast, which is where two reasonably intelligent humans attempt to interpret great and occasionally not-so-great pieces of filmic art. Doug describes himself as the male geek and Ashley is the female academic. It's a fantastic show with wonderful debate and some laughs that covers all sorts of expected and unexpected gems. It can be found over at AboveTheLinePodcast.com and on iTunes and Stitcher. Or like them on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash the Above the Line podcast. Also, why not tune in to the Schlock Treatment podcast? Every week, the fearless foursome fight, faff, frolic and fart their way through the funniest hour of podcasting available online, reviewing the best of the worst of schlock movies streaming currently online in a way only they can. I urge you to discover this terrific gem of a show for yourself now. Find it on iTunes, Stitcher, and over at schlocktreatment.com. You can also follow them on Twitter at schlocktreatmnt. Now available from Curiosity Quills Press, Death, the Devil and the Goldfish by Andrew Buckley, the audiobook. And it's no ordinary audiobook. Narrated by me, your diner host, and available on iTunes, Amazon, and Audible.com, don't pass up the opportunity to immerse yourself in the delightfully madcap and hilarious world of Andrew's terrific writing by hearing me read the novel and provide lots of silly voices for all the characters. That's right! This is no straight, boring old audiobook. This man is a performance. But what's it about, I hear you cry? Well, from the Bahamas to Heathrow Airport to the rain-soaked streets of London, the dead have ceased dying. This is inconvenient for a number of reasons, but what's the real reason behind the chaos? In London, we find Nigel Reinhardt, a disgraced, confused and gifted London police constable who owns a prophetic goldfish. In Ireland, the angel of death questions the value and position of his current employment. At Majestic Technologies, Selena McManus works diligently on a top-secret project. At the South Pole, there lives a very unhappy penguin. When the devil hatches a nefarious plot to take over the world by possessing a cute little kitty and seizing a factory of robotic Christmas elves, it's up to Nigel and his group of unlikely companions to save the world or die trying. Or both. So, want to know what happens and what all those characters sound like? Well, pick it up today and help support independently produced creativity. From Audible.com, iTunes and Amazon, it's Death, the Devil and the Goldfish, the audiobook. Buy it! And lastly, I'm going to suggest the splendiferous in the mouth of darkness.blogspot.com website, the fantastical awesomebmovies.com, and the essential and brilliant hellinspace.com. As between them, they are three movie blogs that will turn your grey skies blue with all their knowledge, wit, and news. Stay up to date, in the know, learn, read, and enjoy with these excellent blogs. Yeah, jazz. Back on the Facebook page. So, then we go on to Mark Burns. Good old Mark Burns. Uh, he writes, my favourites are The Breakfast Club and Weird Science. Favourite character is Chet, uh, nice. like yours, uh, Bill Paxton from Weird Science. <laughs> Favourite scene is when the post-apocalyptic punk gang invade Wyatt's house. Yeah. See, I like them invading the house, but I find the house... Do you ever find this in movies? When you see a house get trashed, you're like, oh, no. Oh, now they're in real trouble. Like, yeah. it just, it, <laughs> I really kind of get involved in the movie. Like, when they have a classic car in an action film and you just know that thing's getting tol- totaled, oh, yeah. you yeah. just know some crazy characters getting in that car <laughs> and ruining it. 
but yeah. and every time it happens, you're like, no, not the Jaguar, no, you know, or whatever it is, or not the the MG or whatever, or the Morgan, or you know, too involved. You are too involved. I get too involved with things. Look at me being a, a consumer, <laughs> wanting things to be pristine and perfect. But yeah, I get very worried, especially when the piano flies out the chimney. Yeah, that really bothers me. It was well, it bothered me because I didn't. I, it's, it's, I guess it's a really big chimney. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it bothers me because I was a pianist. But uh, So anyway, he goes on to say, favorite quotes from Weird Signs. How would you like your friends to know you wear a bra on your head by the awesome Vernon Wells? Nice. Uh, and I haven't got at least favorite because I haven't seen most of his films yet. Uh, uh, maybe we inspired a little uh, marathon. Maybe, indeed. Well, okay. I hope. I hope I inspire. That's all I want to do with oh, the podcast. Uh, yeah. Inspire debate. Inspire <laughs> debate and movie watching. Uh, so we then have uh, Jared Dennison. Uh, mm-hmm. who I don't think has commented on the Diner podcast before. So welcome, Jared. Thank you for oh. writing in. He says, my favorite is The Breakfast Club. Everyone can relate to it, apart from Mr. Tilly. <laughs> yeah. You see yourself in at least one of the characters. Uh, I agree, or, or, or an amalgam of them, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, his favorite character, Ducky from Pretty in Pink, is my favorite character. <laughs> he didn't want to dance in a record store trying to impress the girl next door. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, then he goes on to say, best moment for me, it's a tie between the end, hand in the air, fist pump of TBC. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> and, and the end of Some Kind of Wonderful, which I don't remember what happens. What happens at the end of Some Kind of Wonderful? Oh, well, I mean, a spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, for people who haven't seen a movie that's 30 years old. Yeah, he spent, so his dad really wants him to go to school, and he's been saving up money to go to, to, go to college. And he uses the money to buy a pair of really nice diamond earrings for Leah Thompson's character. Oh, and wouldn't um, you? Because Leah Thompson. Wow. Yeah, I know. She's but a then, fox. At the end, when he realizes he's really in love with Mary Stuart Masterson, his best friend, he ends up giving them to her. Oh. And then they walk off into the moonlight oh. together. I yeah. remember <laughs> hating the end of that film because I was uh, like, Masterson over Thompson? Are you yeah. kidding me? Hasn't he seen Howard the Duck and her in her little panties? Oh. And she's kind of, I don't know, she's a little bit too gruff for me in, that, in, the, in the movie. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Masterson is also with uh, uh, previous mentioned Mr. McCarthy, I think it's Mr. McCarthy in Catholic Boys. Oh. I think I'm right in saying. And, of course, you know, we can't miss the fact that in Pretty in Pink we get my favorite and the Doc's favorite sleaze machine, James Spader. It has to be mentioned. Ow! He's James Spader. He's a sleazy lady raider. He's got eyes that peel their clothes off when he's not even in the room. He's a walking slab of sleazy cheese. He prefers it if you don't say please. He'll tell you to get down on your knees and order his base desires. You will appease. His little black book is thicker than the eyebrows of Ralph Nader. He's our favourite smooth-talking knicker-grabbing greaser. Oh, he's James Spader. Spader's the best. <laughs> Spader is a sleaze bucket of oh, the highest a order. <laughs> uh, I see Catholic Boys is really weird. McCarthy's done some really weird movies, and mm. I have to say, I mean, I know we we said we're not going to get off onto the whole kind of brat pack eighties teen Tough, Uber thing. It's difficult because I have to say that amongst the main body of the brat pack, yep. They do a fairly dive, although it's all around high school or junior school or college or something. They sure. do a fairly diverse variety of films. You look at things like Class. You look at things like Heaven Help Us. You look at St. Elmo's Fire. You look at Pretty and Pete. You look at Breakfast Club. You look at Less Than Zero. You look yeah. at, you know, there's some really, really good variety of films there. Uh, but then let's get on to, because uh, wait a minute, did we read everything? We read everything. Oh, no, worst John Hughes film. Well, Ooh. he wrote. Home Alone 3, so I'd go with that. Yeah. Well, I don't know, did he... Uh, yeah, I don't know, it's semantics at this point. But I was going to say, I don't know if he actually wrote it or if it's just characters. No, well, he actually, he he, actually yeah, wrote he did, it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he produced it too, so that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, but I suppose, like, Home Alone at the time was the highest grossing... For one of the highest grossing films of all yeah. time. Yep. So... You know, and look, after the Home Alone and the Beethoven series, which are the two franchises he kind of sees out his career with, yep. you know, he retires. So yeah, Pretty much, yeah. I mean, he had a couple more hits with, like, uh, Dennis the Menace, which I actually loved. Um, Walter <laughs> right. Matthau was classic in that. 
Right. And, uh, the, you know, the Miracle on 34th Street remake, 101 Dalmatians, Flubber, that kind of stuff. I mean, some of those were, were hits. Um, but then, yeah, you just kind of, that was that, disappeared. I'm just saying if you're going to go into retirement and you're planning for it, you might want to cash in on some of the yeah, uh, franchises that he clearly invested in. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Plus, more he may have had more to say about the child stuck at home, battling off criminal genre <laughs> yeah. that he invented. So <sighs> who knows? Who knows? So to Breakfast Club proper, and why don't you go through it? So why don't you tell us a little bit about the plot, and also tell us like what first struck you about this film in particular? Well. The f- I think the first thing that kind of, that struck me about it as I was watching it was the if I'm gonna the communicative abilities between each character. These are supposed to be high school kids, and even when, you know when I was in high school, we didn't really talk. I didn't talk to any of my friends about the stuff that these guys talk about. You know what I mean? And I guess right. it has a lot to do with the fact that they're kind of forced, basically forced to be together for you know, eight hours on a, on a random Saturday in school because they've all gotten in trouble uh, in some way or another. Um, and the principal has called them in for a Saturday detention. Um, and they all come from, I guess, you know, for lack of a better term, different walks of life, so to speak, or as you were saying, a different, different cliques. Um, and uh, definitely that was the thing that struck me the most when I first saw it was the, um, the conversation topics and how easily they're able to get under each other's skin in the beginning. But then as more comes out about each character and what kind of brought them in to detention for that day, you see the walls start to come down. And also their conversations with each other are very, very honest. Like you were mentioning the part at the end when Anthony Michael Hall asks if they're still all going to be friends on, on Monday. And Molly Ringwald says, do you want me to be honest? No, probably not. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's brutal stuff, uh, especially probably back then because, you know, teen, teen melodrama as it, as it is really, I don't think had ever been uh, explored to the depths that this movie explores it. I don't think. Right. No, Definitely. I mean, as I said earlier, I find that that to be almost the crux of the film Mm -hmm. because it's all about uh, perception. Obviously, you you know, you have that wraparound device of Anthony Michael Hall reading out their quote unquote essay that they've been asked to write by Paul Gleason's fantastically, uh, you know, er er erratic and and idiotic uh, teacher, Vernon. But, you know, so they have that wraparound device, which is obviously all about the perception. You know, you won't change your perception of us. Your perception of us is what it is. There's nothing we can do to change it. There's that aspect to it. But there's also the we can change it amongst ourselves, though. We can change our perception of each other, just even if it's a little bit. And I think the idea that Ringwald, although maybe being honest, says no, I can't see myself being friends with you guys on Monday, kind of shows, it shows two things. It shows uh, definitely something that I think is a truism. I think it's definitely something that really happens if you've ever yeah. broken through to another clique and then the next week it's as if it never happened. Yeah. And I think, but it also shows, you know, your perception of people and your judgment of people from high school onwards is kind of very, it's very difficult to get over that initial judgment of people it's rare in life that you think someone's a dick and then six months later he's your best friend it just doesn't you you know it's just it doesn't happen very often and Mm. you know uh it's it takes a bigger person to let bygones be bygones if someone's fucked you over in the past but then you know you're going to become friends with them or whatever it is it's you know there's a there's a lot of things that have to be got past and get over and and I think she's right. It's 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 not something you can do. And I think that message resonates to me far outside just the idea of high school cliques because I, I mean I don't know about you dude and the, the the people you've met and the, the jobs you've had and stuff like that, but I find as an adult I'm thirty three now, I find going out into the workplace and stuff, people have their cliques, people oh, have yeah. their tastes, people Definitely. have their opinions. Like 
this idea that we all grow up and suddenly fucking know everything and, you know, have have any more fucking ability to rationalize things or <laughs> relax around things or fucking, you know, be less judgmental than we were as teenagers is horseshit. If anything, yeah. I was probably... Uh, less judgmental as a teenager than I, I am now. Say, <laughs> I was going to say, in, in a lot of cases, it probably actually gets worse. Right, which now... Is unfortunate. It's just kind of... Uh... Uh, you, you find your, you know, I'm sure the people who are worse find their group of people to be worse with. And that's why you don't, you know, hear about it as, as much, I guess. I, yeah. I, don't know. I mean, it helps having broad interest. It helps, you know, liking a ton of different movies. So the people I talk movies with, while you could say, oh, they're all movie geeks. We're not yeah. all the same. You and right. I didn't grow up the same way. Me and mm-hmm. Doug didn't grow up the same way. Mo and I are different. Like, it's, you know, even Paul and I, and we're from the same country and, you know, only 60 or 80 miles apart from each other growing up. It, yeah. it, it, it doesn't mean we have the same take on stuff at all. And therefore, I think something like the movie community is a bit more forgiving and inclusive. And I like the whole kind of geek community being kind of inclusive. And, you know, I read an article this week where I think something to do with fake girl geeks or something are kind of getting getting attacked online or something like that. And, you know, (laughs) part part of you wants to say, well, hey, let everyone be a geek. Let's not worry about it. And the other part of you is like, you know what? When we were all geeks to begin with, you know, 20 years ago, we had to suffer the knocks, the slings and arrows and all that when we first did it. And we had to stand proudly going, listen, I like this B-movie or I like this comic book or I like this TV show and you can punch me all you like. So, I don't know, there's part of me that's like, shut up and take your knocks. And there's another part of me that's like, nah, let's be all inclusive. You know, whether you like it or not, that's just like a reality of life. If you suddenly wanted to, you know, and you see it with diff- people with different sexualities and people with different you know, uh, tastes and people with different clothes sense or whatever it is. Like yep. you want to assert yourself, someone somewhere is going to have a fucking problem with it, unfortunately. <laughs> and, you know, I think the, the breakfast club covers all this, this kind of stuff, but yep. let's, um, let's start getting into it. Uh, character wise. So okay. why don't we go through, what are your favorite characters out of the five kids first all or out of Paul Gleason as well? And John, John, <laughs> John Kapalos, the, the janitor Bender. And Brian, uh, Anthony Michael Hall's character. You like Brian? They're, yeah, they're my two favorites. And I'm just, I'm kind of a mark for Anthony Michael Hall. I just, I loved. Uh, he was one of my favorite actors when I was a, uh, you know, younger. Do you think that Estevez is hampered by the fact that he can't have a tash? When it, <laughs> when Estevez has a mustache, he's he's sort of unbeatable. Yeah, this is very true. Uh, I think you are. I think you are correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but without the tash, he comes off as just a bit of a douche. Yeah, and I, I didn't really find his character as as interesting as uh, Bender and Brian's, because um, I, I think those two were like the 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 two extremes, where one of them has a horrific, you know, uh, home life, and Anthony Michael Hall's character has you know, what is perceived by most of the other, you know, kids in the group as a really good home life, but they don't know that, you know, he's, you know, got a lot of pressure on him to have good grades. And, you know, I I think if I'm not mistaken, it's inferred that he was going to, is it inferred that he was going to kill himself with the gun? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was going to kill himself because he was going to get like a a B minus uh, yeah. or something in in and that, woodshop. That's heavy. that's heavy stuff, man. And I just feel like those those two characters are have have the heaviest of the the problems. Well, considering he I, was, I believe, the youngest in the cast, because the cast's yeah. age obviously all fluctuates. Um, but he was the youngest in the cast. His his performance is pretty spot on, and people can go, "Oh, he's playing himself or whatever." But you know. People can't play themselves easily and make mm-hmm. it convincing. His performance, I mean, all of their performances, I have to say, it's, I mean, apart from maybe Emilio Estevez, who I think did better work in classics such as Men at Work yeah. and uh, Loaded Weapon. And Maximum Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive. I think, he, I think he, he, well, I mean, he did Repo Man before this, and he was yeah. very good in that, but... I think Estevez kind of peaked later on. Uh, obviously, Stakeout, where the Tash really comes into its <laughs> into its own. But so I mean, he's maybe the weak link. 
Mm. But I think the performances in this are uh, across the board strong. Yeah, spot it's, on for each one of them, for sure. It's the best Nelson's ever been. It's yep. the best uh, Michael Hall's ever been, although he has done great performances in other films. Yep. Uh, Gleason is, of course, wonderful in, in any yeah. role. Uh, uh-huh. You know, the, he's a sad loss to movie <laughs> villainy everywhere. Uh, obviously, yeah. Clarence Beeks and Richard Vernon, kind of the two 80s villains that he played in this and Trading Places, kind of yeah. really did just, uh, well, just show Gleason to be a genius, really, <laughs> uh, yeah. in his own way. But it and and the first thirty five minutes of the Breakfast Club are just the Nelson Gleason show. Yep. Uh, the which others... is hilarious. I love the way that those two go back and forth. And right. Like the, especially the uh, you you just got one more. How's how's about another one? You want one more? And he's like, Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love. I love That's one more right there. Answer. You're not fooling anybody, Bender. The next screw that falls out is going to be you. It... What was that? Eat my shorts. You just bought yourself another Saturday, mister. Oh, I'm crushed. You just bought one more right there. Well, I'm free the Saturday after that. Beyond that, I'm going to have to check my calendar. Good, because it's going to be filled. We'll keep going. You want another one? Say the word. Just say the word. Instead of going to prison, you'll come here. Are you through? No. I'm doing society a favor. So? That's another one right now. I've got you for the rest of your natural born life if you don't watch your step. You want another one? Yes. You got it. You got another one right there. That's another one, pal. Cut it out. You through? Not even close, bud. Good. You got one more right there. You really think I give a shit? Another. You through? How many is that? That's seven and Clinton one when we first came in. You asked Mr. Vernon here whether Barry Mandelon knew that he raided his closet. Now it's eight. You stay out of it. Excuse me, sir. It's seven. Shut up, Pee Wee. You're mine, Bender. For two months, I got you. I got you. What can I say? I'm thrilled. Oh, I'm sure that's exactly what you want these people to believe. You know something, Bender? You want to spend a little more time trying to do something with yourself and a little less time trying to impress people. You might be better off. Right, that's it. I'm going to be right outside those doors. The next time I have to come in here, I'm cracking skulls. I love that when Brian tries to, like, perk up and give him the right (laughs) answer and he's like, shut up, you. I like the way that Gleason has no, like, he has no time for any of the kids. Oh, like, they're oh. all assholes. He thinks that the princess is too fucking spoiled. He thinks yep. that, but you know, uh, 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 Bender will always be a bum. He thinks that Brian Johnson is like a brown-nosing asshole. Yep. You know, the only one I think he's got a slight respect for at the very beginning is, like, the whole Emilio Estevez, like... Yeah. Uh, I know. think you. I think you get that too when he's trying to help. He's helping him move the magazine rack and, yeah, into yeah, the yeah. doorway, and then and then when he sits down, he's. I expected more from a varsity letterman. You know right. what I mean? So I think that's where that that definitely uh, shows. That, that's where it changes. That's where yeah, he's just right. like fuck these kids. <laughs> yeah, Ali, Ali Sheedy. So I love the bit where he's like, "Whoa, you there? You there? What's her name? Yeah, wake her up! Her. Wake her up!" <laughs> He's just like uh, clicking his fingers. You miss him like that. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. love that. He's he's phenomenal. Like I don't even know how you can hate the Breakfast Club just for mm-hmm. the sheer ma- you know magnitude of his scripting. He's, yeah, just, he's he's definitely one of the high points for sure. Incredible. Michael Hall's <laughs> performance is is great. Nelson's yep. performance is fantastic. It was a bumper year in the old Bender household. <laughs> Drink up, Johnny. Like that whole speech yeah. he gives it. So, I have to say, I, you know, when they're all confessing like what they did yep. to get in there, it, it's a bit ridiculous. Oh, yeah. I, it's it, I don't. The the movie kind of slowly loses me. I do have to say that the first. Yeah. The first 45 minutes are, are very strong. And then when you get into the the uh, getting stoned allows you to scream like a banshee and destroy a glass door bit, yep. it gets a little <laughs> bit ridiculous. I still love it, but it gets a little bit ridiculous. The Yeah, and, and I mean, going back to it, too, is um, everybody's excuse. Well, actually, I don't know that we ever find out why Molly Ringwald is there, do we? 
I don't know if she ever actually outright comes out and says it. Um, but I mean, no, I don't think so. I think you're right. I don't. Think everybody, everybody been. else, you know, like, I mean, Ali Sheedy, you know, I didn't have anything better to do. You know, whether that's true or not is another story. But you know, you know why Anthony Michael Hall is in there. You know why uh, Judd Nelson's in there, and you know why Estevez is in there. And Estevez is he tapes Larry's buns together. <laughs> yeah, it's like his is kind of just like the. I mean, but I mean, when he gets into it, it makes more sense as to why he did it. But I just don't feel like I don't know. I, maybe it's just because I don't really, I don't really relate to his character very much. Even though I did play sports in high school, it was more of just like a your dad, for, fun, for fun kind of thing. You know your, what I mean? Your dad wasn't like, you got to be the best. No, no, he wasn't. You, you have to be number one. You have to be number one. Uh, That's, that, he, that whole scene was kind of like a bit much too. Like, is yeah. he really like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how it is because, you know, I wasn't, you know, Mr. Star athlete in high school. It might be that way for uh, a lot of people, you know, I don't know. So... <clears throat> Poor Toomey was not the state. We were robbed of an athlete when yeah. Toomey was uh, <laughs> was wrongly passed over in high school for for so. other better people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the whole. I mean, Emilio Estevez's storyline. I really couldn't give a shit about. I yeah. hated jocks in high school. I have no no time. Oh, I hated most jocks in high school who sure. were all about the win. I've never yeah, been yeah. a competitive person. I've never been uh, all about that. I don't. I don't understand the mentality of you got to win, you got to be number one. I don't get it. Why can't you just be whatever it is you are? And you just do and the just, best you do. You right. best do the best you can, and right. whatever happens, happens. Right. Uh, you know. So I never kind of understood that. So no, I don't relate to uh-huh. that. I, I, I kind of relate, I guess, in a, in a slightly uh, artistic way, in terms of or creative way, in terms of Anthony Michael Hall's thing. I mean, not that I was ever a mass whiz or anything like that, or I couldn't make a lamp, but the idea of, you know, why can't I just do this? This should be simple. Yeah. And, and I can't do it. And everyone else can do it. And I can't do it. Uh, and I, funnily enough, I probably felt that about math more than I did about woodwork. <laughs> so uh, I would be in a math class, definitely being like, and people at the back was like, oh, yeah, the square root of do-do-do with the X and the Y and the B. And they would understand it like it was a language. And I would yeah. be there. I have no fucking idea what people nope. are going on about. Two plus two, you, I understand. But <laughs> anything more than that, you've got me. I really just don't know where you're coming up with this gibberish uh, and what, what it's got to do with me. So, no, I mean, I had a lot of alienating moments yeah. in, in high school, not being able to do certain stuff. Uh, and then obviously you've got things like, you know, you know, you, I know I could draw and I knew I could act and I knew I could, you know, play a musical instrument, but I could never do any of them to any degree where, you know, that was my one thing. Like that yeah. was the thing that people knew me for. So you're kind of, you're kind of like me. You're like a jack of all trades, a master of none. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> and considering Bruce Campbell was in a series called Jack of all trades, I'll there take that. I'll take yeah. that. I will take that. Uh, no, no problem there being a jack of all trades. So Gleason's amazing. Capellos is pretty, pretty damn good. I love the scene mm-hmm. that him and Gleason share down in the basement. Yeah. Where he's, where Gleason says, he goes, when you and I get old, these kids are going to be running the country. That's the thing that wakes me up at night. <laughs> like, I love the way he says that. What did you want to be when you were young? When I was a kid, I wanted to be John Lennon. Carl, don't be a goof. I'm trying to make a serious point here. Carl, I've been teaching for 22 years. And each year, these kids get more and more arrogant. Oh, bullshit, man. Come on, Vern. The kids haven't changed. You have. You took a teaching position because you thought it'd be fun, right? Thought you could have summer vacations off. And then you found out it was actually work. That really bummed you out. These kids turned on me. They think I'm a big fucking joke. Come on. Listen, Vern, if you were 16... What would you think of you, huh? Hey, Carl, you think I give one rat's ass what these kids think of me? Yes, I do. You think about this. When you get old, these kids, when I get old, they're going to be running the country. Yeah. Now, this is the thought that wakes me up in the middle of the night. That when I get older, these kids are going to take care of me. 
I wouldn't count on it. And he makes a good point too, though. He that's, does because that's... who would? Is... No. Because you wonder how. It's funny. You wonder how someone like Vernon ever became a teacher. But yep. then if you've ever been through high school, you don't wonder it at all. Because there's always those teachers, you're like, you really fucking hate children. You hate teaching. Yep. You're not that intelligent. How did you get into it? You know, you kind of failed to the middle. You've kind of <laughs> failed up to the middle. Uh, and especially in private school. I mean, private school is awash with people <laughs> who are utter failures. And I'm talking about the teachers here. Who are utter failures at absolutely everything else in life. Wow. And therefore, they've just wound up and they've gone, you know what? I've got myself a blazer and I smell slightly of moldy coffee. I guess I could be a teacher. Um, but you don't really you don't really get it um, mm-hmm. why these people decided to go into the education game when they they really don't have any business being in it. <laughs> favorite scenes, favorite bits, sir? Hmm. That's you know, and it's funny because I just rewatched it uh, two nights ago. Let me think really quick. Oh, I obviously I love uh, when Bender's crawling through the ceiling and then he falls out, and everybody is like, "What the hell was that?" And then he just kind of walks in nonchalantly and is like, "I forgot my pencil." Yeah, the, the <laughs> joke he's favorites. telling. The yeah, joke the joke, which telling. I don't know, even know. Did I, I thought I read somewhere that it's not even like a real joke. It's no. just something that he was just saying. He made it up on the yeah. spot. And there is no, there is no punchline to it. No. The punchline is there's no punchline to it. <laughs> but I love Gleason coming in afterwards. He's like, "What was that ruckus? I yep. didn't hear a ruckus." A naked blonde walks into a bar with a poodle under one arm and a two-foot salami under the other. She lays the poodle on the table. The bartender says, I suppose you won't be needing a drink. The naked lady says, oh, my pencil. God damn it! What in God's name is going on in here? What was that ruckus? Uh, what ruckus? I was just in my office and I heard a ruckus. Could you describe the ruckus, sir? Watch your tongue, young man. Watch it. Oh. Huh? What is this? What is that? What? What is that? What is that noise? What noise? Really, sir, there wasn't any noise. Ah! 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 <coughs> that noise? Was that the noise you were talking about? No, it wasn't. That was not the noise I was talking about. Now, I may not have caught you in the act this time, but you can bet I will. <coughs> You make book on that, Missy. And you, I will not be made a fool of. That's that's another one of my favorite parts, but I guess it kind of encompasses the latter half of the movie is when they all start to kind of uh, back each other up a little bit. And um, Yeah, I mean, that's a good little thing. You know, Doug says, I don't know if he understands teenagers, but like the idea that even at the very beginning, even when yeah. they hate each other, Ringwald covers for Nelson. Yeah. And it's this idea that, and it's not fully explored in the film by any means, but nope. the idea that we can all band together and be against this asshole, even if we're assholes to each other, there's sure. still, you know, and not wanting to get too highfalutin about it, but you can kind of look at that and the way adults refer to the government or... Yep. There'll always be a hierarchy that we can go, well, we fucking hate them. Even if we hate everyone else around right. us, we Let's hate them. Let's just come together and hate this person who's right. above us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or the church or whatever hierarchy you have a sure. problem with. Yeah. So that's great. Am I, I don't know what my favorite scenes are. I kind of like, uh, I like the, I just like the first 45 minutes of the movie. That's kind of, to me, I think of it as yeah. all one. The and setup. Then, yeah. Like the, you know, Nelson, the Nelson and Gleason show is just so well written, mm-hmm. and and you get a few of these movies dotted around 
which have maybe one or two locations, uh, you know, minimal cast, but have this tremendous strong script. You know, something like a Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross has. A, I know that was a play, but that has a great script, great cast, m- you know, minimal locations. Yeah. Something like With Nell and I, which is a fairly unknown British comedy, but it has only four or five people in the cast and, you know, one or two locations and a cracking script. And it shows that if the writing is strong, a a lot of the other stuff doesn't ultimately matter in in the great scheme of things. Well, you know, I I think, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think one of the best examples of that, and I, I don't, I, again, I'm, I don't know how you feel about this particular film, but I think Reservoir Dogs is probably one of the best examples of how you can still have a compelling and interesting movie, even if the, most of it is contained to just one um, central location. Yeah, yes. I think Reservoir Dogs is very good. I, pref- I think that I prefer the scenes in which they're not talking about anything. I find the the big middle section of that film a little... I don't know how good the script is for the middle section of the film. Okay. I think But that's what you're talking about, though, where a a movie can still be can still be interesting and can still be um, engaging and entertaining even though it pretty much takes place all in one centralized uh, area. Right, and of course Clerks would do it later on. Yes, absolutely, yeah. To to keep the Kevin Smith comparison. (laughs) Uh... Other notable notable bits in the film? I mean, you've got the two mm. dance sequences, which are kind of ludicrous. Yeah, I like when they go, they all go on the trek to get Bender's uh, dope out of his locker. Yeah, the, sound, pretty, the soundtrack is great. Yeah, the soundtrack is great, yeah. The soundtrack and, is fantastic. And Hughes, we, we should mention, was, I think, one of the first to utilize music in such a way where each song really fits with the scene. Yeah, I think it was Ali Sheedy who introduced him to the Bowie song Mm. where he gets the quote from that's at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. I don't know why that quote explodes. I have no idea why that... That that part's a little corny. (laughs) Yeah, I don't quite know what's going on there. But, you know, that would often happen in an 80s movie. Something would just explode uh, for, for no reason, much like the door later on. Um, I mean, I would say that, yes, the sim- the, where, where the film falls down is the, uh, the slightly heavy-handed symbolism of things like the breaking glass and the, yeah. the, some of the stories they tell. Yeah. Uh, I find that while it is certainly in keeping with people that I've come across, I find the story that, that – uh, John Bender tells about his family and when he starts to pick on Brian. I find yeah. that cringeworthy to watch. I know you're meant to feel that, but it's yeah. it's a moment where you're like, you know what, I was really liking this guy and now he's just being an out-and-out bull sack for no reason. I think it's saved by the fact that when he pulls out the knife, which it just makes him look like such an arsehole, yes. and then he puts the knife on the desk. The fact that Ali Sheedy's two little <laughs> hands come out from under, <laughs> from off the frame and, and, and pick up the knife and put it in a pot, I think that's that kind of brings it back for me. Yeah. You think it got a little bit too over over bloated, maybe, at, in that particular scene? The Breakfast Club <laughs> veers in and out of melodrama okay. quite erratically to some extent. It doesn't mean that it lacks any uh, cleverness or any greatness in the writing, because I don't think yep. it does. But it's it's a lot, to, a lot to ask as an adult now to kind of go back and watch some of those scenes. I think I prefer the lightning quick kind of comebacks and quips that they okay. have in the earlier part of the film. I can understand that. What, but but I but I think that I emotionally engage with the overall concept yeah. uh, that he's trying to put across. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but the I mean, you know, it's a it's a shame Nelson never and and Anthony Michael Hall never had, you know, bigger A list careers because I yeah. really think they could have done. I agree. I, I um, man, I. I couldn't even tell you anything else that Judd Nelson is in this aside from Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. Well, and, Sin- Sin Elmo's Fire. 
Uh, okay, that's right. Sorry, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Um, but I thought, but but Anthony Michael Hall, I can give you a bit more because you know, as I as I said earlier, I was a you know a big fan of his, and um, I, my jaw just about hit the floor when I saw him in Edward Scissorhands. Right. And he played a character completely unlike any character he'd ever played before, and he also was. You know, he had filled out a bit and looked bigger, and I thought to myself, "Wow, if he can do it, I can do it too." <laughs> right. Because I've always been a you know a real skinny kind of kid, so in that I, I think I related to his to to him as an actor more. So um, your because your, of that too. your decision, you were like, "Well, screw it, I'm going to bulk up like Michael Hall, and then then the chicks will really dig me." Is that exactly, what the and was? then I can um, terrorize poor guys who's hands are made of scissors yeah um how does that work out for you (laughs) not very well (laughs) molly ringwald like i get why she had a kind of limited shelf life um you know she made the mistake of showing her boobs early and and that's always a problem i think it's also it's always a problem for any actress like what do i do and when do i do that and why do i have to do it and whatever and she kind of did it for a kind of sleazy straight to video type movie that no one really needed to see so you know, you know, that was unfortunate. I thought she gave a very good performance in The Stand. I thought she was very good in that, uh, one of the later things that she did. But, yeah, I, I kind of see her shelf life as, a, 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 as fairly limiting. Ali Sheedy, a uh, man, I had a crush on Ali Sheedy. Yeah. I, had, I was all about the Sheeds back in the day. <laughs> uh, I was definitely... There's something about her smile, man. I don't know what it is. She's got a... She's just got a, a a little grin that you just ah uh, yeah. There's something about the sheets, man. I can't tell you this. I mean, San Elmo's fire. She dresses like a fucking fifty-five-year-old matron, sure. un- unfortunately, uh, and has that ludicrous uh, sex scene where she keeps her pearls on, which is just quite it's the most bizarre. ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your entire life. But you know. She was in short circuit, and yep. uh, you know if, if 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 she can melt the cockles of Johnny Five's heart, then oh, yeah. she's she's got me. She's completely and totally lovable in that movie. I'll give you that. Yeah, I mean, I like her in that. I think if I could really have my druthers, it would be her and Leah Thompson. Oh. In in the same kind of, I would want to see her and Leah Thompson as kind of panty wearing ass kickers. Yeah. If I had kind of my, my male fantasy oh, action yeah. wish. Nice. Uh, they would be taking, <laughs> taking, taking mothers down, ta- taking names. Uh, she's obviously in War Games, Oxford yep. Blues. Oh, I forgot she was in War Games. Actually, yeah. she's kind of likable in that, too. Oh, she's kind of likable in everything. She's in, <laughs> what else is she in? Only the Lonely. Mm, I don't know that one. Oh, well, she was in an episode of the Red Shoe Diaries. Oh, I do remember seeing uh, episodes of that program every <laughs> of <course>. now and again. <laughs> if you were a teenager in the 90s and you enjoyed masturbating, everyone had seen an episode of The Red Shoe Dive. <laughs> and then, of course, her big comeback was High Art, where she played a lesbian wow. that had a lot of critical acclaim. She doesn't look that bad now, either. No, I mean, you she know. Aged, she aged all right. She aged all right. I was more about her in the younger days, I have to say. But she aged okay. Uh, she needs to put on a little weight. She's a little skinny. Well, most of them are these days. Yeah, I don't get that. <laughs> I don't get that whole that whole thing. Well, I think it's starting to kind of uh, dissipate a little bit finally. Yeah, I agree. I hope so. I hope so. But no, I I uh, I love it. Dude. I love the Breakfast Club. I put it in. Not necessarily once a year, but certainly once every other year. It yeah, kind absolutely. of ends up cropping cropping up and uh, being put in the, the disc. And as I said, like I watched it recently with John and, and Hamble, and John, I don't think he'd mind me saying, has slightly more particular taste than I do. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way. He's probably just more discerning than I am. I'm probably yeah. more all over the place. And he loved it. Like He thought the writing was nice. great and, and, and so on. So, I mean, that, that to me was an endorsement. Of nothing, if nothing else, because you know, there's a bunch of films I love that he's like laughs at, you know, sure. in, in a in a friendly way, but laughs at. And and this this wasn't one of them. This is one that he totally totally got and understood. So uh, yeah, that's it's, good. it's it, his. Unfortunately, I think that Hughes is is the kind of guy that it, it's just you, you'll you're never going to get anybody else 
like him, that was as good as him. You'll never get any uh, any movies that were will be anywhere near as as you know universally loved as his are. I am um, often imitated, never replicated. I mean, and you 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 would do yourself a great disservice to go around marketing your movie and saying that, oh yeah, you know we 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 did it in the vein of like a John Hughes type of movie. You know what I mean? If you mention that name in um, in the same sentence as your own movie, you're going to do yourself a disservice because no movies will ever live up. I don't think to the ones that he did. And and I'm ma- making a specific example to a giant steaming pile of garbage that came out recently called take me home tonight. That had, <laughs> um, what's his name there from that 70s show? Why can't I to for Br- grace to for grace? Right. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, some parts of it I thought were okay, but it's just, it's, it's garbage. And, Hughes would have never made a movie like that, and just the fact that I remember seeing interviews that Grace, did, that Topher Grace did on TV shows when the movie was starting to come out, and he mentioned John Hughes in every single one of his interviews, and I was just like, "Yeah, you're raising my hopes quite high now, buddy," and it did not live up to them. Well, it's funny because you know the '80s, uh, time and time again, has tried to have revivals. Uh, obviously, American Pie, things like Take Me Home yeah. Tonight, Hot. Hot Tub Time Machine, yep. stuff like Cop Out and some of the action movies that we're seeing recently. And I think yep. certainly in the action genre, it's being more successful because yeah. they seem to understand why 80s action movies were as good as they were. I yep. don't think people fully understand why 80s comedies and 80s dramas were as good as they were. Mm-hmm. And I think that one of the things is that while I wouldn't be as universal with my praise for Hughes, I do love Hughes. I think he's a very good writer. I think what he did uh, was very good. I, I think there are other people who have done uh, similar uh, work as as good as his. And mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, and I do think people like Crow and to some extent Kevin Smith and to some extent sure. Richard Linklater and people like that. Oh yeah, have, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, have kind of carried the torch to some extent, although maybe the scripts aren't as strong. Uh, I don't think he's completely infallible. I think he's 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 done a, a, a ton which is either mediocre and a ton which is, is, is bad when you look at some of the later stuff he did. Yeah. But I tell you what he did and a lot of other eighties people did that you just don't get anymore. And I don't know whether you get it don't get it anymore because all of the concepts have been used up, but you just don't get them, those movies where and I think people used to look down their nose at them, but where you could sum them up in a sentence. Yeah. Where And I, what I mean by that is not necessarily sum up all the intricacies of it or the characters or whatever, but sum it up like, you know, this is a movie about five mismatched kids who have sad day detention and learn to like each other or whatever it is. Like you can boil right. it down to a sentence. It, it's a concept. It's like big is a concept. It's about a kid wants to be an adult, ends up living as an adult, finds, you know, whatever it is. These these movies that had a concept, the Vacation has a concept, 16 yeah. Counters has a concept. And, and they just don't make movies anymore where you take a, a, a good, strong concept, write an intelligent, funny script based on this very good, strong foundation of a concept, and just play it out as in a, in a, a way that you would want to see it go. In, right. a, in, in just in, a, in a, 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 a pleasant, not too proud of itself, not too clever, clever, just in a decent, strong way. Here's our concept. Here's our characters. Here's our tight script. And away we go. And I think yeah. he did that very well. I think he did it very well with character based. I think his concepts are more character based, although something like Weird Science obviously has the magical element of something like a big or whatever it is you know and they've tried to do it recently with stuff like the change up and things like that it just doesn't it just doesn't play as well anymore it's just for some reason you know maybe it's all they're all done or maybe the writing now is not as strong but it doesn't i think there's there's a thing that's lacking nowadays too is that these movies that were made back in the 80s, had a sense of, oh, man, I don't really know how to explain it. It's like, 
every comedy that's made now is like it's like a it's like a almost like a parody you know whereas right. these movies like i think one of the best examples i can come up with is ghostbusters right that's a ridiculous fucking premise okay right. but you buy it because everybody in the movie is is there and takes everything compl- totally seriously right and i don't think that you get I don't think you get performances like that nowadays, really, especially in comedies. And I don't think that you get the same sense of everybody involved with the movie being on board and and kind of taking it seriously to a point where it's just believable. Right. I mean, I've said it recently that a lot of comedians these days, they're all becoming the same person. Mm. They're all kind of the same. They all serve the same function. Whereas yeah. if you look at something like uh, uh, Ghostbusters, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Bill Murray, they all serve completely different functions in that film. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you look at something like This Is The End, that movie that's just come out with you know, the most fucking self-congratulatory, self-congrat- self-referential <laughs> fucking <laughs> blowjob of a movie that just came out. <laughs> All the people in there serve exactly the same function. They're all uh, they're all overweight. They're all Jewish. They're all stubbly in a kind of trendy kind of boho way. Uh, they're all eager, maniacal. They're all you know slobby. They all master like every, every single person in that movie serves the same function. There's no they're all deli- the same character. Yeah, there's no deli- delineation between any of the people in the film and. You know, you can label the charges of of, of uh, stereotypes or whatever, or simplification at Hughes's work or Ackroyd's work or you know any of those people from the eighties. But yeah, on, honestly, I think that if you've got a strong enough set of characters and if your story is compelling enough, I think most characters have to start on the page as some form of cliche because the audience has, in the first five minutes, got to go, "Oh, I get it." You know sure. that. They're the sensitive one, they're the heart, they're the head, they're the joke, they're the mouth, they're the whatever, you know, whatever function they serve. The sooner the audience can recognize who everybody is. Right. Then you can start breaking the the characters apart like he does in Breakfast Club. Then you can start making them more similar and you can start saying, well, here are the places where they have stuff in common. Here are their morals. Here are what they are. You know, and you just don't get that anymore. I mean, in This Is The End... They start off fat, schlubby, Jewish, annoying, brash-mouthed, masturb- masturbatory-obsessed yep. assholes, and they end the movie as that. And it, that's not necessarily to come down to that particular movie, because yeah. it was okay. It was okay. It was a three yeah. out of five. It was fine. I laughed a lot. Right. But, there was, but it, it didn't do anything. Like, yeah. it, it didn't, there was no point to it. Like... It, uh, to some extent, like Judd Apatow has been compared to like a kind of raunchy John Hughes or whatever, but yeah. he's I not think like it... his concepts. Maybe for the first couple of movies he did, knocked up a forty-year-old virgin. Yeah, but but even he doesn't stick to those concepts. Those nah. concepts are merely just a framework so that they everyone can improvise. Because isn't it funny how people yeah. can improvise? Well, <laughs> no. The only successful movie I think that people have improvised. There isn't a Christopher Guest film. There isn't Spinal Tap. That isn't. Yeah. If you take Guest out of it, because he's just a fucking master. But <laughs> the only Apatow successful uh, improvised movie, for my taste, is Anchorman. And since then, yeah. it's all been a variety of the same schlubby whatever. And look, yeah. I, I relate to that, of course. Yeah. I'm a pot-bellied, beardy, <laughs> schlubby Jewish guy who hangs around watching crazy movies and discussing pop culture but Christ I don't want to see 50 of me in a movie yeah no, that's a good point you know but and that, that's where I would praise Hughes even if Tilly believes them to be simplified cliches I still think that's a a worthy place to begin absolutely and, and his success so have we done it justice sir do you think we've done it justice I think so yeah I think we uh, I think we did great justice great to it. justice we will be <laughs> dip, we will be dipping back into Hughes again at some point and sure. I will definitely be revisiting the 80s Brat Pack uh, for certain because I'm a I'm a big fan of that. For me, it's like it goes hand in hand with slasher films for some reason. There's just yep. there's just 80s genres that I can just <laughs> as silly as they become, and as 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 you know, bad as some of them can be, I just embrace them. I just I just see their benefit, and I don't think they've been bettered. Mm-mm. 
Uh, but no, I think Hughes does something a bit more intelligent with the with the genre, and you can't, sure. like I say, if 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 these filmmakers whip in just a little bit of message, that's more message than most. So right. congratulate them and praise them. Well, look, thanks ever so much, Scott, for being on the show. I hope you've got to say everything you wanted to say. Absolutely, it's been my pleasure, sir. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, enjoyed it again, sir. Enjoyed it, and we'll, we will have you back uh, either either just yourself or or with others to to do more shows in the future, most definitely. Terrific. All right, dude. Well, take care. Take it easy. Have a good night. Have a good weekend, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, bud. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. What do you say we close that door? We can't have any kind of party. We're burning. Checking us out every few seconds. Well, you know, the door's supposed to stay open. So what? So why don't you just shut up? There's four other people in here, you know? God, you can count. See, I knew you had to be smart to be a, a wrestler. Who the hell are you to judge anybody anyway? Really? You know, Bender, you don't even count. I mean, if you disappear forever, it wouldn't make any difference. You may as well not even exist at this school. Well, I'll just run right out and join the wrestling team. <laughs> Maybe the prep club, too. Student council. No, they wouldn't take you. I'm hurt. You know why guys like you knock everything? Oh, this should be stunning. It's because you're afraid. Oh, God, you Richies are so smart. That's exactly why I'm not heavy in activities. You're a big coward. I'm in the math club. See, so you're afraid that they won't take you. You don't belong, so you just have to dump all over it. Well, wouldn't have anything to do with you activities people being assholes now, would it? Well, you wouldn't know. You don't even know any of us. Well, I don't know any lepers either, but I'm not going to run out and join one of their fucking clubs. What? 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 Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Get them knees up. Come on now, won't you come see about me? I'll be alone, I'll have my knees up, you know it, baby. Tell me your troubles and that's giving me everything inside and out. And I said, life's strange, it's so real in the dark. The thing called the tender things that we were working on. Ah, slow change, it may pull us apart. Ah, when the light gets into your strawberry top, baby But don't you oh, forget about me I said, don't, 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 don't Don't you oh, forget about me Will you stand about me? Look my way and never love me. Yeah, the rain keeps falling. That's right. The rain keeps falling on that rain. Will you recognize oh, yeah, me? Exactly. I said, call my name or do the Lambeth walk on by me? The rain keeps falling. The rain keeps falling on down, down. Listen here, I've got more to say. No. Now don't you try and pretend you slag. It's my beginning, we will win in the end. Oh yeah, harm you or touch your defences. Vanity, insecurity. Yeah. Don't you forget about me. Well, I'll be alone, I'll be needing up, you know it, baby. Going to... I take you apart, I'll put us back together in my strawberry top, baby. Don't you forget about me. I said, don't, 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 don't you forget about me. Don't you forget about me, you slay. And you walk on by. Will you call my name, Jack? As you walk on by I'm doing the Lambeth walk doing the Lambeth. Will you call my name? I will call it, I will call it Will you walk away? Rabbit, rabbit Rabbit, 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 rabbit She just won't stop talking How oh, will you do the Lambeth walk away? Call Blimey Cap I always do the Lambeth walk Doing the Lambeth walk on by Will you call him my name? You will call my name. Call my name. Oh, have you got your 
we all sing all together now. La 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 There are men, and then there are second unit podcast men. The podcast you've just been listening to is part of the Second Unit Podcast Network. Find all of our shows at 2upn.blogspot.com or on Facebook under the Second Unit Podcast Network. Our fantastic list of shows include Drunk on VHS, We Came from the Basement, No Budget Nightmares, The After Movie Diner, Dr. Action and the Kick-Ass Kid, and Blood Baths and Boomsticks. Take one podcast into the shower. Don't be a blithering idiot, Alan. We can give you the multiple podcast cleansing system all in one place that your hair deserves. Our programming is available across all platforms from iTunes to Podomatic, TalkShoe to Stitcher, so you have absolutely no excuse. Listen today and a free naked person of your choice will be shipped from Thailand to your door in a matter of weeks. The Second Unit Podcast Network, bringing you the action and leaving the boring stuff to the other guys. Bloody hell, who does a girl have to blow around here to get a decent beverage? <laughs>